Well, our speaker today has campaigned for human rights, democracy, global justice and LGBT freedom for 47 years. In case you don't know, LGBT stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender. He works with democracy and human rights activists in many countries, including Iran, Iraq, Uganda, Zimbabwe, Palestine, Russia, Pakistan and many other countries. He's won many awards and accolades, including the Irwin Prize in recognition of his lifelong commitment to human rights. He's a distinguished supporter of the British Humanist Association and he'll be speaking at the World Humanist Congress in Oxford next month alongside Baroness Joan Bakewell. Will you please give a really big welcome to Peter Tatchell. Surrogacy, 
the right of women to have donor insemination, uh, on all these issues, extreme Christian fundamentalists have led the fight to deny women rights. Even in extreme circumstances, going as far as murdering abortion doctors. Um, they've also, of course, uh, led the fight against equal same-sex marriage. They've led the fight against sex education in schools. Uh, they've led the fight against the provision of condoms to prevent the spread of HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. And indeed successfully forced successive American governments to, uh, certainly in the past, to restrict foreign aid to NGOs that do not promote condom use. Um, that is not only morally wrong, it's actually putting people's lives at risk. Um, in Nigeria, we see the extremes of Islamist fundamentalism, represented by Boko Haram, uh, whose kidnapping of those schoolgirls is just the tip of the iceberg of the reign of terror that they've unleashed against critics and secularists uh, in Nigeria. Um, we see that the Christian fundamentalists in Nigeria uh, promote the witch hunting hysteria, the literal hunting of witches or people perceived to be witches, um, you know, particularly women and children. Um, they preach a gospel that children who uh, are nonconformist in whatever way, who are disobedient or whatever, that these are possessed by devils. But it even not involve physical characteristics. You know, if a child doesn't stuff us, some of these Christian pastors say this is the devil inside the child. And these churches not only denounce uh, people who they perceive to be possessed by witches or who are themselves witches, um, but they subject them to abusive rants and even actual physical violence to beat the devil out of them. Um, we've seen in Nigeria this year new draconian anti-gay laws which ban LGBT organisations, ban the advocacy of LGBT equality, and now a new law that's in the parliament which would take away, take away um, rights and the licence to operate for NGOs that receive foreign funding. And those NGOs, not just LGBT ones, but also ones that are working for women's rights and for the rights of minority peoples, persecuted tribal peoples within uh, Nigeria. Uh, in Uganda, we have a similar pattern where the Christian churches, including the Anglican Church of Uganda, which is part of the Global Anglican Communion, has played a major role in orchestrating the new Anti-Homosexuality Act which came to force this year. Already, already in Uganda, uh, before this legislation, uh, male homosexuality was totally criminalised in all circumstances with a maximum penalty of life imprisonment. This was under a law that was originally imposed on Uganda by the British colonial administration in the 19th century. What the new legislation does is up the ante. Now, any kind of same-sex contact, even mere kissing and cuddling, is punishable with an automatic, mandatory life sentence. Life imprisonment for a kiss, a touch, it's unbelievable. And the people behind this legislation have been Christian pastors. And those Christians who have spoken out against this new law like Bishop Christopher Sanonjo, who was part of the Anglican Church, but was forced out because he spoke against the persecution of LGBT people. He's been expunged from the Church of Uganda. He's 80 years old. They've taken away his pension because they say that as a Christian pastor, by defending equal human rights for gay people, he is an abomination. That he is doing the devil's work. That he is anti-Christian and unfit. They won't even allow him 
to officiate at the christening of his grandchildren. Uh, this is how the church in Uganda has gone. It's become an instrument of oppression and intolerance. And also, I have to say that it is allied very closely with the regime of President Museveni, who, as you know, uh, with the overthrow of uh, Obote many years ago, he was seen as the great democratic savior. And indeed, for a few years he was. But now, he is going the way of Robert Mugabe, an ever greater slide towards authoritarianism and tyranny. And yet, the church in Uganda is in many ways supportive of his regime. Um, in Russia, we see the close relation between President Putin and the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, both are using each other. Um, Putin sees the church as a valuable ally and therefore he sucks up to their demands for increasing religious intolerance and crack down liberal values. And they see him as their instrument, as their man in the Kremlin, the person who will force back legislation on a range of issues that concern the church. In particular, of course, again, the new draconian anti-gay law in Russia, which prohibits any kind of LGBT visibility, like holding hands or just saying I'm gay or lesbian, and also outlaws any kind of gay advocacy. Even to the point where organizations that provide counseling and support for vulnerable suicidal gay teenagers who've been abused and thrown out of home by their families they have been targeted for prosecution. All across Russia, university lecturers and teachers who are gay, lesbian, bisexual or transgender are being sacked from their jobs. Not because of anything they have done or said, but simply because of their sexuality or gender identity, which the school education authorities deem is unfit and inappropriate. So they will be bad role models for young people. So you get a flavour that in so many jurisdictions around the world, Christian fundamentalism is spearheading the attack on human rights. You can see a similar trend in Judeo fundamentalists. Um, in Israel, um, the Christian fundamentalists weren't there, but the Jewish ones were very strong. They were opposed to women being allowed to pray at the wedding wall. So this is an attack by a Jewish fundamentalist organization on Jewish believing women uh, who wanted to believe they had a right to pray at the way of the war. Well, fundamentalists very strongly opposed that and made many um, abusive and even violent attempts to stop women from praying at the way of the war. Uh, those fundamentalists in Israel are also some of the key blocks to a genuine peace in the Middle East. Uh, and when we look at the current escalation of the conflict uh, right now, uh, it relates to events that have happened in recent weeks, but the, the real root cause is the fundamental injustice of what has been done to the Palestinian people. Uh, of course, Jewish people have a right to live in peace and security, and you know, the firing of rockets into civilian areas by Hamas and other jihadists is utterly wrong, it's a war crime. But Israel's extreme retaliation, indiscriminate attacks, with the killing of many, many civilians, uh, really is also a war crime, and has to stop. Has to stop. You know, this cycle of tit for tat violence is leaving too many people on both sides dead. Although most of the casualties, of course, are Palestinian. Um, when we look at the role of the extreme religious fundamentalists in Israel, we find that the secular movement in the West Bank, the occupied West Bank, is spearheaded by people who embrace an extreme form of Judaism, a belief that this is the Jewish promised land and that all non-Jews should be expelled. Um, that mentality, those settlers, are key causes of the current 
uh, conflict and tensions in that region. Um, we also, of course, saw attempts by Jewish fundamentalists to block the hosting of gay pride parades in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, and other cities. You know, they went to court, they physically tried to stop the parades. In some instances, they attacked the parades. Uh, a few years ago, extreme Jewish fundamentalists actually charged the crowd and stabbed people. Um, so, it isn't just Christian fundamentalism, there's also Jewish fundamentalism. Um, in India or in other parts of the world, we see a problem with Hindu fundamentalism. Uh, you know, Hindu fundamentalists were responsible for the massacre of uh, Muslim people two decades ago, and they preach an extreme hate of Muslims and indeed uh, disparage Christians and people of other faiths as well. Um, and there does seem to be in India a rise of Hindu fundamentalism, which takes a very uh, materialist and extreme supremacist interpre interpretation of Hindu texts and which seeks to persecute other religious minorities. Um, Shockingly, surprisingly, and unbelievably, we now have the rise of Buddhist fundamentalism. So in Sri Lanka and Thailand, um, just to name two places, um, as well as Burma, um, we see this rise of extreme Buddhist nationalism and fundamentalism, which has prompted uh, widespread attacks, particularly upon Muslim people. Um, you know, who would have thought Buddhism, traditionally the, the religion of peace and um, coexistence, uh, preaching love and harmony, that it could be ever twisted, distorted, manipulated to uh, result in the kinds of horrendous violence we are seeing against Muslim Rohingya people in Burma today? And those refugee camps, um, they are, you know, they look like concentration camps. You know, the conditions are appalling, the people are hungry and malnourished. And yet this is being done in the name of the Buddhist faith. Um, and then when we look at Islamic fundamentalists, again we see a similar pattern of extremism and attacks upon human rights in Iran, Saudi Arabia, Syria uh, and many other countries. Um, we see one group of Muslims persecuting another group of Muslims. So you have a situation in Iraq where since the war in 2003 there has been uh, extreme infighting and sectarian violence between Sunni and uh, Shia Muslims. Uh, originally of course uh, it was the Sunni minority who had the upper hand under Saddam Hussein but then, after the war, the election of the Nouri al-Maliki government, we've seen a, a sheer dominated government come to power, and the situation has been reversed. Either way, religious persecution is wrong. Uh, in Iran, of course, we have a scenario where it is a sheer dominated state, where Shia Islam is the state religion, and where Sunni Muslims uh, Baha'is, Zoroastrians, and other minority faiths <coughs> suffer extreme harassment and persecution. Um, in large parts of Iran, um, Sunni mosques have been bulldozed, libraries destroyed, uh, scholars and students of the Sunni branch of Islam have been arrested and framed on false charges. Um, it truly is shocking that in the name of Islam, uh, Iran persecutes other Muslims who don't conform to its particular interpretation. Um, you know, we see in many, many countries Sufi and Sufi and Ahmadiyya Muslims persecuted. Even in Britain, even in Britain, the main Muslim organisations uh, take a very hostile view towards Ahmadiyya Muslims and regard them as not true Muslims. Um, when uh, a Luton newspaper recently 
carrying an advert celebrating a special day in the Armenian Muslim calendar, the mainstream Muslim organizations in Luton denounced that paper for giving a uh, platform to what they call apostates, uh, non-believers, kafirs, um, and forced the newspaper to apologize. The newspaper made a public apology for hosting, for carrying an advert from Amiga Muslims. Um, presumably, just out of financial, out of financial um, perspective or for financial reasons. They didn't want to alienate the larger Muslim community, but that surely is absolutely wrong. And there have been many, many uh, violent threats and quite a few attacks upon a million Muslim people in this country. And it's a great issue that the police, the Crown Prosecution Service, and Muslim organisations are not facing up to. Muslim people who belong to the Amiga sect in this country live with a degree of fear from other Muslims in this country. And there are many, many violent threats made against them. Um, you know, having an overall look, examination of, you know, this religion on religion uh, attack on human rights, there's been some considerable research which suggests that overall the religious group that suffers the greatest persecution are in fact Christians. So Christians in Saudi Arabia, um, Iran, Iraq, um, uh, many, many countries, uh, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, uh, parts of Africa like in the northern regions of Nigeria, Christians do suffer very severe persecution with frequent violent attacks on individuals, on their homes, and on their churches. I think some of you probably are aware of the horrendous bombing in Peshawar of a Christian church some months ago, where I think about 80 people were killed, um, deliberately targeting the people as they were leaving the church after the service. Um, so for all these reasons, for all these reasons, this is why I am a humanist, and secularist. Now I respect the right of other people to hold their faith. A misguided I think it is, because I believe in a rational, scientific understanding of the world. But at the end of the day, um, we do need to acknowledge and recognize that wherever religion has power, nearly always it abuses it to persecute others who don't conform to its particular tenets. So that's why I'm secular. I'm not intrinsically an anti-clericalist or anti-religionist. You know, I, I don't share religious views. Um, I think they are not the most helpful explanation of the world and why we're here and how we're here and all those things. Um, but I think a lot of people confuse secularism with anti-clericalism. Um, secularism is simply saying uh, that there should be a separation between religion and the state that no one faith should be privileged over others, that no one faith, or indeed all faiths, should have privileged status in law. Um, that creates a level playing field for people of all faiths and none. When you have the privileging of one faith over others, you end up with situations like Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, or Iran, where one particular strand of faith has state sanctioned power and others are persecuted and, and vilified. Um, I want to live in a society where we uh, have uh, no privy status for any religion, where all faiths and none can be equal. Uh, I mentioned Iran. Um, of course, we share with Iran a unique distinction. The British Parliament is, apart from Iran, the only parliament in the world that has automatic places reserved for clerics. So we have 26 bishops who sit automatically as a right in the House of Lords. The only other legislature in the world that gives clerics that status, automatic status, 
in legislature is Iran. Um, not a particularly um, honourable um, something we want to be proud of. Um, of course, there are the proposals that in a reformed House of Lords, um, far from doing away with clerics in the House of Lords, there should be also reserved places for clerics of other faiths, not just the Church of England, but other faiths. I think that would be a very, very retrograde step. Um, here in this country, we uh, pride ourselves on freedom of speech, and that, of course, must be defended. But sometimes that freedom of speech strays over into incitement to hatred and violence. And often it comes from people of faith. Um, many of you who probably be familiar with the case of Sheikh Abdullah Al Faisal, who in 2004, I think, advocated that Muslims should kill infidels, particularly Jews and Hindus. Now he was put on trial, eventually convicted, and sentenced to nine years in prison. But the fact that he even said those things is shocking in itself. Around the same time, <coughs> Imam Abdul Muhyid in East London said very similar things that gay people should be murdered, that gay people were the enemies of Islam, that they were Allah's enemies, and they should be killed. He wasn't even taken to court, let alone prosecuted, convicted, or punished. And, you know, we can only speculate as to why, but I'm told, I'm told, that one of the reasons was because the police did not want to upset the Muslim community. They thought that if he was prosecuted, if an imam was prosecuted for saying that gay people should be killed, that would provoke um, a bad reaction in the Muslim community. That would be, what they said, stoking the flames of Islamophobia. Well, my question is, are we all people for the law or not? You know, why should anyone, for any reason, be above the law if they're inciting violence, if they're advocating murder, which is a very serious criminal offence? There should be no exceptions, and certainly no exceptions because of someone's faith. Um, every year in London, there is the Global Peace and Unity Conference. Somewhat misnamed, it's an Islamist event, which often features preachers who advocate that women should be forced to wear the hijab, that young girls should be subjected to female genital mutilation, that gay people should be killed, that Muslims who don't conform to their particular hardline interpretation of Islam should be put to death. These kinds of speakers have been at this global Peace and Unity Conference, which is backed by the Mayor of London and the Metropolitan Police. <laughs> Unbelievable! If the speaker from the platform was saying kill black people, they'd all be arrested. The conference would be closed down. But because they are a religious faith, they're given extra license and allowed to continue. Um, when we look at the recent battles over lesbian gay law reform in this country over the last decade or so, we see that on every single issue, organised religion has opposed equality. So the Christian fundamentalists have banded together with the Jewish fundamentalists and the Muslim fundamentalists to oppose an equal age consent, to oppose the repeal of Section 28, to oppose the right of Lesbian gay people to serve in the armed forces, to oppose civil partnerships and civil marriage, to oppose equality in laws to prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. On all these issues, they have banded together to oppose equality, to defend discrimination. I'm sure, you're familiar with the recent battle over equal marriage and the way in which. The leaders of all the major faiths spoke out condemning and opposing any attempt to give same-sex couples the right to marry the person they love. 
The only glint of silver in that dark cloud was the NFP poll, or maybe you got poll, which found that actually 55% of people of faith in this country supported same-sex civil marriage and register rights. 55%. The leaders were clearly out of touch with the grassroots congregation. That's the hopeful sign. That's the hopeful sign. Um, I, of course, have never resorted to tit for tat. I've always defended the rights of people of faith um, to hold their point of view, even if I disagree with it. And some of you will know that over the years I've defended um, the right of street preachers to say that they believe homosexuality is wrong. I'm disappointed and sad that they think that, because in my view, discrimination and homophobia are not Christian values. But nevertheless, in a free society, they have the right to say that. And here in Bournemouth, uh, when Harry Hammond was arrested um, for saying that homosexuality and lesbianism were immoral, I thought that, well, I didn't agree with his view, but I thought to arrest him and convict him for simply saying that homosexuality is immoral, I thought that was a step too far. In a free society, we have to accept the right that people have a different viewpoint. And they should be able to express that, providing not threatening or inciting violence against others. So I offered to act as a witness for Harry Hunt. Um, he was so homophobic, he defined. <laughs> um, but it was, I was quite shocking that he was convicted. You know. um, there have been other instances as well. Um, some of you may recall the case of a housing worker, Adrian Smith, who was demoted from Trafford, Trafford, Trafford Housing Association up in Manchester after he wrote on his Facebook that he opposed same-sex religious marriage. Now, you know, the housing association said that he was supporting discrimination and that he brought the uh, housing trust into disrepute. Even though he said this on his own personal Facebook, albeit he did say somewhere on Facebook that he did work for this organisation, but he was demoted um, uh, and I mean, had a massive fall in salary. And I think that was absolutely wrong. I, I disagree with him, but he, he, he actually supported same-sex civil marriage, he simply objected to same-sex religion marriage on the grounds of his particular interpretation of Christianity. Now, I disagree with him, but I defend his right to say that. He shouldn't have been punished, he should have been challenged, questioned, debated. You know, he wasn't a nasty person. You know, quite clear from his uh, Facebook post at the time, he was, he was a considered thoughtful man. He made it very clear he was not against gay people. But just he did believe that, you know, you know religion or the church should not be required or should not support religious marriage for same-sex couples. So what I'm driving at is, you know, I and many, many others, we defend religious people when they suffer victimization or persecution, whether in this country or elsewhere around the world. What a shame, what a pity that that defence is not reciprocated. That when it comes to, particularly to women's rights and gay rights, that so many people of faith do not reciprocate. They would not like to be discriminated against. They would not like the law to say that Christians have fewer rights, or Jews or Muslims or others. Yet they are prepared to defend and even demand that on the ground of the faith, they should be able to discriminate. And you're all familiar with the case of the Christian bed and breakfast couple who refused to hire uh, their premises to a gay couple on the ground that it was against their faith. Well, apart from the fact that, you know, in law, thankfully today, if you offer a public service, you're not allowed to discriminate against anyone. Not only can't you discriminate against gay people, you can't discriminate against Christians or Muslims or Jews or Hindus. And quite rightly. Because if we want to live in a free and open society, a caring, compassionate, inclusive, tolerant society, there is no place for discrimination. 
What that Christian friend and reference couple were seeking to do was to discriminate. And when they cried persecution, what they actually were crying was that they should have the right to discriminate. They should have the right, on any basis in their faith, to discriminate against any person that on the grounds of faith they are taken to. Again, I say, discrimination is not a Christian value. So, we have a situation in Britain now where we have many, many fantastic quality laws. Really great. You know, those laws exist to protect you, me, everyone. They're a real strong guarantee that we have a society where people don't feel marginalised and excluded. Yet all those equality laws have written into them certain qualified exemptions. Most notably when it comes to LGBT people. So in Britain today, although we have these equality laws, a religious organisation, not just a place of worship, but faithful on schools, hospitals, nursing homes, and shelters for the homeless, are permitted in law to discriminate against LGBT people in certain circumstances. If they can demonstrate that it's necessary for the defence of their religious ethos. So it means they have the right to refuse to employ a gay person, or to refuse to refuse to provide a service to a gay person. That strikes me as extraordinary. You know, again I just emphasize, I accept the right of people of faith to hold their views. But I don't accept their right to discrimination. And I don't accept their right to be above the law. And that's what they've won. That's what they've won. They're persuaded the majority of politicians that because they hold a faith, the laws on equality and non-discrimination that apply to everyone else should not apply to them. To me, in a democracy, we should all be equal before the law. There should be no exemptions for Christians or gay people or the BNP or anybody else. We should all be equal before the law. Because that's the way you have an inclusive, compassionate society where we get along together and we all have equal rights and equal responsibilities. So in conclusion, I think that when you look at Britain and when you look around the world, organised religion is the single greatest threat to human rights. It is using and abusing its power. It is often manipulating its congregation to incite hatred, in extreme cases even violence against others with whom they disagree. I think we need to support those within faith who challenge that, build an alliance with them between secularist humanists and, and people of faith with liberal, compassionate values, to stand up to those in power and authority, whether it be the leaders of the Islamic, Christian, Judaic, Hindu, Sikh or other faiths. We need to build an alliance to defend the human rights of people of all faiths and none. And to argue that in every society, religion may exist and should not suffer persecution, but nor should have privilege. Religion should be subjected to the same laws, the same values, the same human rights principles as everyone else. Thank you. speak unless you've got the microphone, and when you've got the microphone, just, just speak clearly into it and just hold it steadily in front of your mouth. Okay, so um, do we have any questions for Peter? Right, I saw his hand go up at the back, so I'll come to you at the and then you go. Thank you. Um, we've heard this absolutely gobsmacking story about the Christian Church and the ills of the world across cultures, across countries, 
And one wonders, surely there must be a common factor. And I suggest it is the love of power. Well, I guess in part it is a love of power. People who have power often want to retain it because power has lots of privileges. But I think power obviously derives from different places. Um, in many cases it's political power. Uh, in other places it is religious power. And I think that for religious orthodox, you are bound to be you know, authoritarian. You're bound to... Uh, excuse and all kinds of abuses. So to me, um, one of the things that <coughs> probably needs to be done is for there to be grassroots movements within faith to challenge those at the top. And one of the very encouraging signs in uh, parts of Europe, in the Catholic Church, is the We Are Church movement, which is a grassroots Catholic rebellion against the Vatican and against uh, bishops and archbishops, where individual Catholics of faith are seeking to reclaim the church from the hierarchy, uh, seeking to devolve power down to the grassroots level. And this has partly been brought out in revulsion over the Catholic Church's mishandling of the child sex abuse scandal, but also a whole litany of things about you know, the church still opposing contraception, and abortion, still opposing um, uh, embryo research, stem cell research, uh, still opposing surrogacy and, and donor insemination, still opposing gay rights, the list goes on. Uh, I think, you know, the true power should reside in the people, whether that be in religion or indeed in any society. The people ought to be the power. I'd just like to raise something that you haven't mentioned, and it's about China and their history. Uh, one of the biggest rebellions in China since 1949, and the creation of the Republic of China, was the Taiping Rebellion. And as a result of the Taiping Rebellion, which itself was as a result of organized religion, there were many millions of people killed, many, many millions. Now, I would say this, that that is why China now uh, are using repressive met methods to repress the Falun Gong movement, and I believe that this is, is one area which is a big threat to China in the future. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. Um, the Chinese state has a long and sad history of authoritarianism and tyranny. Um, the persecution of Falun Gong, but also uh, the persecution of Christians in China. Uh, a pastor has recently been, Christian pastors recently been jailed there, uh, just in the last week. Um, there's also, of course, the severe repression of Muslims in the outer regions, um, in Urumqi and other uh, uh, cities with big Muslim populations. Uh, there's also, of course, the ongoing occupation of Tibet, um, where a benign form of Buddhism is, is, is facing extreme state control and persecution. Um, I think uh, the growth and explosion of Christianity in China um, seems to coincide or mirror the pattern in Russia with the demise of communism. Um, with a void in terms of an ideology or belief system, uh, religion has stepped in to fill that vacuum. And as the Chinese Communist Party is increasingly discredited, you know, it's communist in name, but it's effectively super capitalist in practice, and incredible corruption and vast wealth inequalities, um, into that scenario, um, Christianity is, is a rising and, and growing force. And I think it is a response precisely to the corruption, inequalities and injustices of the communist regime. Yeah, you spoke about the law. You believe that everybody should be equal before the law. And I agree with you. And you were saying about this caveat 
because people are religious faith, but they don't have to, you know, the law is not exactly the same for them in certain areas. And the big question here is, who is it, who is in the wrong? Is it people who have these religious views who we may not agree with at all? Or is it the people who make the law and the society that's made the law to allow this kind of thing to happen? And I've got lots of friends who, you know, who are liberal and they believe in human rights and equality. And I say to them, how many times have you read the Bible or the Quran or the Torah? And none of them have actually read it and they don't know what it, stand, what it stands for. And I think the, the problem with society at the moment is we've gone through a bit of a spiritual problem ourselves. You know, we've had the financial crisis. And, no, you know, people are starting to realise that materialism doesn't always pay. So we, we're sort of black in direction ourselves. And, and I think sometimes we need to ask ourselves, what actually is equality? And we mustn't be afraid to, you know, look at what other people do believe and say, if we feel that's wrong, that we, we should say that, we shouldn't be afraid to say what we believe. To answer the first part, I think you're right. It's a combination of the religious organisations that are seeking to deny equality to certain sections of society based on their particular interpretation of faith, and the politicians who have conceded to them. And of course, you know, I, I you know, you know, I've got to say that you know, the Labour, the Labour government, Tony Blair, was the big, big, big problem in this field. Um, under Tony Blair, for the first time, um, probably for 100 years, religious leaders were given privileged access to Downing Street. Um, the Labour government, Tony Blair, uh, instituted a system whereby all major social policies were first sent out to consultation to religious leaders. And religious leaders were invited to Downing Street to be consulted about the proposal. Now, no other group in society had that privilege. You know, human rights groups like Amnesty International, they were never consulted about civil liberties issues or other, other human rights questions. Um, you know, so religion was given a privileged place by Tony Blair's government, and it's being continued by David Cameron's government. Um, of course, it was Tony Blair uh, and the Labour government that pioneered the big boost in faith schools and uh, free schools, the idea of free schools and academies, um, where we now have 20 or 25 academy schools in this country which teach a version of creationism as, as, a, as a parallel to evolution as being an equally valid um, idea or theory. Um, but all that began under Labour. And I'm having a kind of, probably many of you are a member of the Labour Party, I'm not having a go at you personally, but I think Labour has a lot to answer for because it began this process, which of course has been continued and escalated by the Conservatives. Um, you know, I think the whole issue of funding of faith schools is deeply, deeply problematic. Um, you know, the idea that children should be educated in a religious way or a religious sectarian way, the idea that you know, uh, prayer and faith has to be a compulsory part of, uh, of school assemblies. I mean, it is wrong in this modern era, in this modern day and age. You know, people are entitled to their faith, but faith should not be forced on young people in schools. And that's what our current education system does, even in non-religious schools, through compulsory worship and prayers in, in, in schools. Um, I would like to see us move to a situation where we have a single, truly, genuinely, high quality, comprehensive school system um, where there are no faith schools uh, and certainly no more faith schools than we currently have. Yet, under Michael Gove, the pressure and plan is to continue to fund faith schools, to expand them, to allow free schools and I'm sure many of you have heard, you know, a free, free school that's due to start in September has just been closed down. Um, there are lots and lots of issues <laughs> around the conduct of those schools and the quality of the education that they provide. I think 
it's part of human nature to want to better yourself, which is what distinguishes from the other groups. Um, where it gets a bit dubious is when you want not merely to better yourself, but set yourself the target of being better than the Germans is. That, that's a race that not everybody can win. But striving for some power and influence is not all that reprehensible. Um, what is so reprehensible is the fact that people who do achieve some power and influence, having got up the ladder and do their best to kick away the, the rungs up which they climbed. Well, I'm sure you're right. Uh, in the organised society, you have to have some degree of power structure, uh, you know, representative or participatory. You know, there, is, there, is a, there has to be a system of delegation of powers. And the point, of course, is to make sure that those powers have certain limits upon them so that people in power can do whatever they want. That there are checks and balances to constrain what they do. And of course, the Human Rights Act is a fantastic example of a piece of legislation that seeks to defend and protect the rights of each and every individual by ensuring that there are certain limits beyond which the state cannot go. So protection against arbitrary arrest and imprisonment, um, protection against torture, um, the right to free speech and the right to protest and so on. These are all about checks and balances on power. So you're right, power is a necessary part of an organised sophisticated society, but the important thing is to have those checks and balances. Yes. Do you agree with the statement of the historian Lord Acton, the end of the 19th century, who said, all power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And also, I'd like to know which party you belong to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I agree that the the trend, or the pressure, or the inclination is that once you have power, you want to hold on to it. Once you have power, you want to exercise it. And I think all throughout history, we've seen so many examples of people who perhaps started out with very good intentions ending up being corrupted by power. Uh, I'm sure Tony Blair never really intended that he would drag this country into an illegal war uh, with such devastating consequences for the people of Iraq, which of course is still experiencing to this day. But once he got into power, he seemed to have this view that he had the power and that based on his particular interpretation and uh, understanding of the situation in Iraq, that he was going to exercise it despite the opposition of mo most people in this country. So there's one example. Another example is that uh, I have on my wall at home a picture of a man in a seminarian suit. And that man is Joseph Stalin. He started off as a Catholic seminarian. Uh, a man motivated by good religious instincts who ended up, of course, becoming one of the great tyrants of the 21st century. And you could say that the system of power that was established by the communists after 1917 created a self-perpetuating system where, in the absence of democracy, accountability, checks and balances, those at the top ended up using and abusing their power to sustain themselves and to sustain an ideology and a system that did not have popular support. So I would say that uh, you know, democracy is not perfect. You know, democracy has its flaws and shortcomings, but it is the best system we have. And so far, but there may be some new genius in the future, so by no one's come up with a better system. So I think, you know, democracy is a system where, in principle at least, uh, power is by and for the people, uh, the government is accountable to the people, and you have a system of elections. 
Um, of course, in some countries, you have a system of recall. You know, if an elected politician is not up to the job, they can be, by public referendum, recalled to face a new election. Uh, this was indeed counted at some point by the coalition government, but it seems to have fallen by the wayside. Um, myself, as you probably all of you will know, most of you know, um, for many years I was a member of the Labour Party. I stood as a Labour candidate in the 1983 Birmingham by election. Uh, which I think most commentators say it was probably the dirtiest, most violent, and certainly the most homophobic election in British history. Um, but uh, in recent years I've joined the Green Party. Um, and, you know, I don't believe any party is perfect, but in terms of my humanitarian values and ideals, I believe the Green Party is closest to it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just a quick one. Um, <clears throat> with the international situation on human rights and um, certain abuses, um, you know, we have um, the ability to call for action and sanctions. I mean, in, internally, obviously, we can um, do things, perhaps as the church seems to be uh, doing abuses using the law, but outside, internationally, it's important to uh, um, aggravate the situation so sanctions can be uh, achieved, which, which is what happened in South Africa, actually. Um, you know, in the 80s, and uh, even Liberal Democrats were um, fighting the fact that uh, you know we 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 shouldn't be stopping people from buying uh, pineapples in um, supermarkets and things. What point would you say that some African countries, where there are religious uh, tyrants perhaps wielding their power, we should say that sanctions should be brought about against those countries? Well, whether the tyranny is motivated by religion or politics or anything else, I think it's very important that we show solidarity with people in those countries who are fighting for democracy and human rights. I don't think we should be seeking to impose Western values. Uh, we should be seeking to uphold the principles of universal human rights as enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which all the countries of the world have signed up to. Uh, so if you look at every country around the world, even the most extreme fundamentalist country, whether it be fundamentalist religiously or fundamentalist politically, in every single country there are people who share liberal progressive humanitarian values, who believe in the principles of human rights. So I work with people in Iran, uh, Uganda, Russia, uh, Sudan, Somalia, and many other countries. Um, where horrendous things are happening. But these are people who are challenging that. And I think the best way to bring about change is not by the West waving the big stick or threatening invasion, but by supporting people within those countries who are seeking to make change. But having said that, of course, uh, Britain and other countries give a lot of aid to countries with uh, very dodgy human rights records. Um, and I'm very pleased to say that the coalition government has taken a review of that aid and now has a full policy that it will not cut aid because that would punish poor people. I mean, the poor people in Russia or Iran or Iraq or wherever, they're not responsible for the human rights abuses. If you take the aid away from them, they will starve. They won't have clean water. Their kids won't even get educated. They have infectious diseases will be rampant. So it would be very wrong to cut it. But what the government has proposed and has done in some countries is switch aid. Switch aid from human rights abusing governments to NGOs and aid agencies that don't discriminate and that do respect human rights. So for example in Malawi, a lot of British government aid has been taken from the government there over corruption and other human rights abuses and given to some local government bodies in Malawi but also to NGOs in Malawi. So the aid is still getting through, it's just not going to the government. And the same with Uganda. A lot of British government aid has been withdrawn from the Ugandan government because of its widespread human rights abuses. The poor people are still getting that aid, it isn't going to the government. So that is the way to do it. In terms of you know, the principle of boycotts uh, and so on, 
I think that yes, um, you know, boycotts, sanctions, and disinvestment are very good tactics um, to you know pressure human rights abusing governments. They don't always work, but sometimes they do, and certainly they help often turn public opinion against their governments because people see the consequences. So, for example, some of the uh, sanctions that were imposed on Iraq after the first Gulf War uh, were well intended but actually harmed ordinary people the most. It meant that you know, prices for lots of basic essential commodities and medicines became out of the reach of ordinary people and caused a great deal of, well, literally, hunger and malnutrition um, in parts of Iraq. So you have to have those sanctions targeted they need to be focused on um, not harming ordinary people. Uh, so, for example, for Zimbabwe, um, a lot of the sanctions have targeted particular key people in the Mugabe regime, but they're not generalised sanctions. So there's been travel bans, um, the freezing of accounts, uh, and so on. Um, in some instances, some countries have pursued a policy of uh, ensuring that um, luxury goods that obviously benefit the elite uh, should uh, there should be an import export ban uh, in, in that way. Um, right now, of course, with the flare up in the conflict in Israel and Palestine, many people are renewing the call for boycott, sanctions, and disinvestment from Israel over its policies. And I think that that actually is a, a far more effective response than um, you know, Hamas firing its rockets. I mean, first of all, those rockets are immoral. You know, rockets from Hamas and other jihadist groups which target civilian areas, that is a war crime, just as much as Israel's indiscriminate attacks on Gaza is a war crime. Um, but the Hamas tactic isn't going to work. Sanctions, disinvestment, and boycott will. And of course, Israel depends hugely on American, British, and other aid to sustain itself. You know, I believe that we should yeah. be, you know, given an ultimatum to Israel that it must withdraw to its 1967 borders, otherwise all that aid should be cut, and there should be a comprehensive program of boycott, sanctions, and disinvestment. It's not because I want to punish Israel; it's because every reasonable appeal to that country and its leaders have failed. And of course, we know that within Israel there are many, many people who also want a piece of justice who do not believe the occupation of the West Bank and all the hundreds of thousands of settlers there is the right thing. They too want peace and justice. So again, it's about supporting them and supporting their struggle. Um, I would like the Israeli government to recognise that you know, things cannot go on the way they are, that their own policies are actually undermining the security of the Jewish people. I often joke to people that I, if I didn't know better, I would think that successive Jewish leaders in, in the state of Israel have been secret closet Hamas agents because their policies, their policies actually inflame and actually support and encourage the jihadists. You know, far from diffusing the situation, when they allow hundreds of thousands of people to set on the West Bank in Palestinian areas, when they allow the house demolitions, house demolitions in East Jerusalem, when they allow uh, settlers to go and root up Palestinian farmers, olive groves, kill their sheep and so on, that action is actually fueling the, uh, the conflict. Um, you know, I've always said that in my view, uh, it's a risky gamble, but I, I think that the way forward uh, would be for Israel to unilaterally announce it was withdrawing from the West Bank and to uh, you know, bring the settlers out um, and to start funding the building of schools, roads, hospitals in the Palestinian areas. That kind of tactic would pull the rug out from under the Islamists because their version there is that Israel is unreasonable. Israel is occupying our land. If Israel ceases to do that, the public support for the jihadists and the Islamists, the Hamas and others, would dissipate. I'm not saying it would end overnight, but it's very clear from the different opinion polls that have been taken 
a majority of Palestinian people do want to live in peace with their Jewish neighbors. You know, Israel's actions actually incite, encourage, and sustain Hamas and the other Islamists. It's a, it's a very, very misguided policy. And I think, again, it shows partly, of course, the reason is that Jewish fundamentalists, extreme Zionists, have a stranglehold over successive Israeli governments. And again, that's where religious fundamentalism is causing so much damage. In particular, with your attack on faith schools, I think you should remember that the, the first educators of every child are the parents, and the parents choose and want the faith schools, whichever of the great faiths it is. So that's not religious fundamentalism, that's just the parents wanting help in raising their children in the way that they see fit, in the same way that you want things that you see fit. And with regards to humanitarian aid around the world, you need to remember that the greatest providers of humanitarian aid at all levels, especially down on the ground, in the refugee camps, with the starving in Malawi, and right around the world, and they are the faith, the Catholic Church in particular is the biggest provider, and most trusted by the charities who wish to give their donations and their aid to the people that are suffering in every possible way through war, famine, refugees, etc. So I think it's unfair for you to, to treat, talk about religious fundamentalists. There are not very many religious fundamentalists, though they get, better, they get a lot of uh, media attention. The people down on the ground, your people like the people here today, give and give around the world to charities, people on their doorsteps and everywhere else. And thank you very much for hearing me. Mm -hmm. Well, as I said when I began, I said that I don't label all religious people, all people of faith, as fundamentalists. I acknowledge the good work that some people of faith do, and that some people of faith are great defenders of human rights and equality. Um, and you're right that in many uh, aid agencies, um, people of faith are working, um, and there are many good religious-inspired um, uh, aid agencies like CAFOD, who are, which are doing great work around the world. Uh, some of them, of course, um, you know, the aid goes with a religious message, um, and I think that some of it is not entirely uh, benign or not entirely um, without attachments. Uh, but overall, I'd say you're right that, that aid agencies uh, supported by and communicated by people of faith do a great deal of good work. Um, I think where I would uh, add the caveat is that, of course, equally there are many non religious and non faith organizations that are doing great work. So, for example, the humanist movement in Uganda is doing, doing fantastic work. Uh, in terms of aid and education. Uh, and in Uganda they have um, humanist schools which do teach about different faiths but don't impose a faith upon young people. Um, they also teach about non-faith. Um, so it's a very, very different message from the richest funded schools in Uganda which force faith on the pupils regardless of what they want. Your point about um, faith schools in this country. But of course, some parents do choose to send their children to faith schools. It's their choice. Sometimes it's because they have a faith, and sometimes just because the faith school happens at the local school or a school with very good results. And I'm certain that, you know, I know that many. have to make the choice, otherwise, the child just goes to the local faith school. They always have to make the choice. No child gets. It does. They do. there, there are selection criteria. There are selection. There are selection criteria, of course. And 
you know, it leads to some parents claiming a faith they don't really have and going to a church that they don't really believe. No, no, that's, there's been a lot of research which has shown that quite a lot of parents, because a local faith school has good results, um, because it's up there in the league tables, they choose to send their child to that school, not because they have the faith. No, not they choose. They choose. They have free will. It's democracy. They choose. And you can't get past that. Okay. Well, they choose because, sadly, our education system is often the case that in our education system, comprehensive schools are not adequately funded and uh, are not, don't have the same resources as some faith schools. Um, and of course, faith schools get all kinds of tax breaks as well. Um, you know, I'm not saying that faith schools do a bad job in many areas, but what I do say is that I don't think it's right that at taxpayers' expense, a school with a particular religious viewpoint should re receive funding and be able to promulgate that viewpoint to pupils. Every school, whether it's a faith school or not, should teach about religion, and indeed non-religion as well, about humanism and secularism as well, but should not impose it upon the pupils. I have been very lenient, um, but uh, the rule is you can't speak without the microphone. We've got another 10 minutes. We will wrap things up at uh, 3.30. I'll try to get around everyone if I can, but it's, it's, I'm doing my best. Okay, and next. Peter, when I uh, read about um, the views of Peter Hitchcock, uh, I
you know, I'd say that the trajectory of history is not a straight line. You know, it doesn't go straight from the Dark Ages to Enlightenment and beyond. It's a zigzag, it's a spiral of snakes and ladders. But overall, the trend of history is towards greater human rights. You know, when you look back to just, you know, say over 100 years ago, when women were not deemed to be fit to vote, and when the church living in this country fought tooth and nail to deny women the vote. Uh, when people talk about suffragettes, people forget the suffragettes burned down churches. And I'm not sanctioning it, I'm not agreeing with it. <laughs> but the suffragettes burned down churches because the Church of England was the foremost opponent of votes women. You know, in those days, the church preached that women were subservient to men. That Wives must submit to their husbands. That was the religious nonsense that was taught, that held women back. Um, and of course, even today, there are still people, or some people of faith in this country, who do not believe in women's equality. Um, you know, the whole issue of women priests and women bishops, you know. You know, the Catholic Church is saying, the Catholic Church is saying that no woman on earth has the spiritual or moral capacity to be a priest. You know, what an insult to a female humanity. And of course, in this country, we still haven't got any women bishops. Um, you know, it, misogyny and patriarchy is so deeply ingrained in organized religion. But it is progressive. It is progressive. We are, we, have, we didn't have women priests in the Church of England, you know, a few decades ago, now we do have. And the world hasn't collapsed. You know, the world hasn't ended. You know, we were told in the debate on same-sex marriage, you know, you pass this legislation, the next thing you'll be marrying cats and dogs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it hasn't happened. But yeah, this is the fear-mongering that religious fundamentalists have always used to try and defend their particular hardline interpretation of faith. Um, when I look at, I said, the arc of history, you know, we are a better humanity than we were 100, 200, 500 years ago. We still have a long way to go. Yeah. But we have made huge progress. And it's been down to people like yourselves and you know, your forebears who fought for these basic rights and freedom. You know, I can hear criticise the Queen or the Church of England. Uh, 200 years ago, uh, I would have been risking imprisonment and worse. Uh, and it's down to the fact that many brave people chose to resist those laws, to oppose the sedition laws and so on, that uh, we are in this special place today. Having said that, my only standing conviction is under the Ecclesiastical Courts Jurisdiction Act of 1860, <laughs> formerly part of the Brawling Act of 1551. Under that legislation, Places of worship have privileged protection, 100% protection against any form of dissent or protest. So under that legislation, anybody who interrupts a minister of religion during a service, no matter how briefly, politely, or with whatever justification, they are committing a criminal offence. That's what happened when I went to the pulpit of the Archbishop of Canterbury in uh, 1998 with my colleagues from Outrage. We did not abuse the Archbishop or the Christian faith. We did not use insulting language or offensive words. We calmly, simply criticised Lord Carey, as he now is, for advocating legal discrimination in law against gay people. He wasn't merely saying that gay people are wrong or immoral or sinful. He was saying the law of the land should discriminate because homosexual people, he said, were morally inferior to heterosexual people. So we simply went to the pulpit and criticised. And um, that's how I ended up getting my conviction under the 1860 Ecclesiastical Court jurisdiction. <laughs> I could have been fined under £5,000 and sent to prison for six months. But the magistrate, uh, assessing the evidence and uh, acknowledging that it was a brief, polite protest, um, he decided to find me the princely sum of £18.60. How do you think the Davison inquiry should be implemented? 
Well, I think it should be implemented, yes. Um, and it's quite stable in the way in which people are trying to manipulate this as an attack upon press freedom. Mm -hmm. um, the National Union of Journalists, which I'm a member, has had a code of conduct for over 30 years, which seeks to encourage journalists to report stories in a fair, non-biased, balanced way. I've tried and pretty much closely followed it for the last 30 years. It's never stopped me once in saying something or revealing or exposing something. All it simply meant is that I don't, you know, use language that panders to prejudice or that, you know, encourages stereotypes. So, to me, the biggest challenge of Everson is to ensure that it's implemented and that there are enforcement mechanisms. <coughs> and those enforcement mechanisms have got to be some kind of legal penalty, a substantial legal penalty for major media houses, because unless they're going to suffer a serious financial cost, many of them will simply ignore it. And to me, the most important part really is not so much about privacy, although that's an element of it. It really is about accurate, <coughs> balanced, non-prejudiced reporting. So newspapers and indeed other media don't use inflammatory and sensitive, bigoted language. Um, and if you believe in free speech, that's not going to stop anybody's free speech. Free speech will continue. But it just means that you can't go and use pejorative language. And I think that's, that's fundamental to you know, a democratic, free and inclusive society. We want to live together, you know, we've got to try and eradicate you know, prejudiced language and reporting around Muslim people, around Jewish people, gay people, women, whatever. Um, the challenge right now is, of course, uh, the way in which the industry, the newspaper industry, has set up their own rival organisation, Ipsos. Um, which um, is supposed to be an independent adjudicator uh, instead of Leveson. They claim it's implemented most of Leveson. In fact, it hasn't. You know, the new newspaper regulation body set up by the newspaper barons, it's implemented you know, a handful of the, the key elements of Leveson. Um, what I'm concerned about is that the government really isn't pushing on this, but it seems to have you know, died in the water. But the principles of Leveson certainly are good. You know, the principles are that if someone is being misrepresented in the press, they will have a statutory right to reply so that what has been said inaccurately about them can be corrected within, I think, you know, seven days or ten days, something like that. that. That's really, really important to a free press. A free press is not a license to say what you like. It is a license to say what you like, providing you're not factually inaccurate, committing libel or, you know, other things that damage and harm other people. Hello, Peter. Thank you for your talk this afternoon, which uh, I pretty well agree with is probably 99% of. Anyway, that's by the by. The question I was going to ask was, how far can the free and open society that we live in be tolerant to the intolerant? And I refer specifically to the Salman Rushdie many years ago, where huge amounts of Muslim people on the streets were incited the death of Salman Rushdie. It cost the British state tens of millions of pounds to protect him. In my view, those people then incite violence on the street, which is over and above free speech, should have been arrested, frankly, and the British state didn't do it. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I think we are in a period when liberal values are under threat and attack from many quarters. Um, in response to terrorism, we find increasingly that our government is willing to uh, erode and cut back on cherished freedoms and rights that we have historically had. Uh, the, you know, the new uh, surveillance powers the government's unveiled and plans to rush through Parliament is a good example. Um, there may be some necessity or requirement for some diminution of powers in exceptional circumstances, but not this last minute rush uh, proposal, which will I think have one day's debate in Parliament. You don't make good legislation 
rushing something through Parliament. There is no absolute emergency. The government knew about this three months ago. They knew about the European Court judgment I think, back in April. Um, there's no need for this legislation to be rushed through. There should be a full and proper debate over several days. So they can look at the degree of necessity uh, compared to the degree of expediency. And so we can get a measured response. And I think it's rather sad that in the name of defending freedom, <coughs> successive governments have actually sought to undermine freedom. They're saying, for the sake of security, we must have surrendered these freedoms. So, sorry, sorry, Peter, I don't know whether you missed the point I'm trying to make. The point I was trying to make in a free and open society like we have, how far can we, as a as, as state or a nation, defend uh, the intolerant within our society? How, how far can we be tolerant to the intolerant? And I quote the disarmament yes. issue. And in my view, the Salman Rushdie, the people who incited hatred and inciting the death of Salman Rushdie, should have been arrested by the British state. Do you agree with that position? Yeah, I do, I do. If, if, if you're inciting violence, and inciting murder, then that is a criminal offence in this country and almost every country in the world. And I agree that um, when it comes to those who would take away other people's freedoms, then um, they have a right to express their point of view up to a certain point. Um, you know, if people want to argue for an Islamic state in a free society, they should have the right to do so. What they shouldn't have the right to do is to advocate that women who have sex outside of marriage should be murdered, or that a media Muslim should be murdered. And people in this country, in this country, have done this and not been prosecuted, not even arrested. Um, you know, you know, we only we can only survive as a free and open democratic society um, if we accept free speech. But then when it comes to those who would harm others or encourage others to harm others, that is a red line. Um, particularly for me, um, you know, any incitement to violence, that is the red line. Uh, on free speech, you know, I don't like homophobia or racism or other forms of prejudice, but I'm reluctant to criminalise them unless there is an incitement to violence. But when there isn't a sign of violence, that ought to be criminalised. Because no one should have to live in fear of threats and violence against them. And a good example, of course, is the, uh, the eight Jamaican reggae and dancehall singers who have been putting out tracks, songs, openly advocating the killing of LGBT people. Uh, none of them have ever been prosecuted, either here or in Jamaica, even though both countries have laws against incitement to violence and murder. So it is double standards. And you know, we need to be very clear that um, you know, those who are in of others should not be tolerated, they should be challenged, and if they incite violence, should be prosecuted. Having said that, um, you will all be familiar that just recently Abu Qatada has been acquitted in a Jordanian court. And I've got to say that um, I got a lot of stick for saying so, but uh, right from the outset I said I thought the case against him was very flimsy, and indeed it was and proven to be very flimsy. Um, I think on some of the uh, Islamist extremists, um, um, you know, the case against them is, is very circumstantial and not strong enough to justify a prosecution. Uh, where it is clear, then of course they should be prosecuted. But I think that we sometimes have strayed over into a situation where people who have expressed uh, unpalatable views have been prosecuted. Um, it's like the, 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 the issue, the issue of, of people, Muslim people going into Syria to fight. Well, I, I would make a very clear distinction. I mean, the government seems to be saying that anybody, any Muslim person who goes to Syria, full stop, will be liable to prosecution. But I think we have to recognise there are some Muslim people who are going to Syria to support humanitarian organisations. They're not going there to support extremism. Some are going to fight, but for the democratic opposition, not for the Islamists. Extremists. We need to make that distinction. And, you know, I have war violence and so on, but in the case of Assad and other ex extreme dictators and tyrants, I can accept that, you know, maybe a, a violent response and resistance is the lesser of two evils in some circumstances. Um, you know, 
I think of the example of you know, the International Brigade who went to Spain in the 1930s. Um, people who went to another country to fight what they believe, and I believe, was a just resistance to Franco's tyranny allied to German and Italian fascism. Uh, for some Muslim people in this country, they have the same view towards Assad. They're not going there to support al Nusrat or ISIS or any of the other extremist groups. They're going there because they genuinely want to support Democrats uh, and uh, human rights advocates. And what's really sad about the reporting on Syria is that um, it's, it's been polarised somewhat into there are two sides, Assad and the Islamists. In fact, there's several different sides, you know, and there is a side that is a democratic left-wing opposition. And there's been some uh, amazing work by women's rights activists at great personal risks um, to try and challenge the Assad regime non-violently and peacefully. Um, and that sort of democratic left alternative in Syria has almost been completely written out of the narrative. But there are many, many people in Syria today who don't support Assad, who don't support the Islamists. They do want a genuinely free, democratic, human rights respect in Syria. People, we're over time, I'm afraid. So those of you I promised I'd get to, and I haven't done that, I apologise. So, um, but there's no need to run away. You can stay and chat. Peter's going to be here for a little while. But will you please give another big round of applause? Thank you.